Revit, of course, right, uh, is pretty information rich, right? Like all the all the model elements <clears throat> in Revit are coming in with all kinds of data and locations and properties. There's a lot of like information that you can extract for scheduling, um, for all the documentation that you're gonna do later on in your sort of design sequence. Um, Rhino, on the other hand, is, is more of a sort of generalist modeling tool. Um, Rhino is kind of information scarce. It has a lot of sort of ability to make geometry and intricate forms and complex surfaces, but it doesn't really um, store any information about them other than the geometry itself. There's no, I mean, you can assign materials, but beyond that, there's no information about like, you know, wall construction or um, column structuring or levels or grids or any of the other kind of, uh, you know, um, file setup that comes with Revit. Uh, and so even though Rhino is very popular as kind of like a design iteration tool, like an early stage kind of concept modeling program, it becomes a little difficult to take uh, your designs and, and then kind of integrate them into Revit. And furthermore, Revit, right, you guys have probably realized is a little difficult to model with. It's not really a very flexible modeling tool. It's really good for um, sort of grid-based and linear construction elements. Um, but it really lacks any ability to easily model um, like custom objects. And so this tool Rhino Inside then allows you to kind of bridge between the two and to have sort of the modeling flexibility of Rhino and the sort of information richness of Reddit. Um, so I've set up a little template file. I have a few, a few files that I'm gonna be using. I'll put them in a zip uh, and give them to Dan to distribute to you. Um, so if you ever need to go back and look and reference it <clears throat> at what we covered today, it'll all, it'll all be there for you. Um, so the first thing it'll do, well, first you really need to install uh, Rhino inside. Um, you can do that, right? It's pretty easy. You're going to go here and it'll just be, you know, download Rhino inside Revit all the installation stuff for McNeil. McNeil makes Rhino, all their installations are really easy. So you should have no trouble getting that. And once you've got it installed, then you'll have a little uh, like toolbar tab in your Revit window right here. So you'll come over here and you'll just say start and you're gonna load up. And if you've never been in Rhino before, um, this might look a little unfamiliar. If you know your way around Rhino at all, what you're gonna see uh, in just a second is a Rhino window um, that's literally loaded inside uh, sort of the Revit um, operating space, right? So still, still booting up here. Right, so now all of a sudden our toolbar comes to life. If I click here, I now have a Rhino window and you'll notice that down in sort of my uh, taskbar, down here, there's no Rhino application open, right? I didn't open Rhino. I just have a Rhino uh, interface, literally, you know, inside Revit, the name is appropriate. Um, and so this right now, this is just a blank Rhino file, um, but I can do anything, anything that I want that I would normally do, right? So I can draw a box, everything is, everything is here. Um, and so I have a, a preloaded template that we're going to do, that we're going to work with. So I'm going to say open. And we're going to go here. And so this is, you know, that you can see, right, I have a little bit of geometry just modeled in some, some arbitrary stuff that'll make a little more sense in a minute. But right now, right, I have my Rhino window open, but you can see in Revit, um, nothing's happening, right? We have no sort of link. We haven't established that connection. And what that is gonna do, or how we do that is, is through Grasshopper. And so um, I don't know how familiar some of you all might be with Grasshopper, but it's, uh, it's like a visual scripting uh, environment that lives inside Rhino, right? So it gets a little bit tricky, but we have Rhino inside Revit, and then we have Grasshopper inside Rhino. And Grasshopper is what's really gonna drive 
the link um, between the two programs. So you can come here, you can either uh, say type grass, right? So Rhino is all kind of command-based in the same way that like AutoCAD is, right? Everything is gonna be by command. So I could enter the grasshopper command here in Rhino, or I could also uh, come up here in the toolbar and pick grasshopper. Either way is fine. And so just like I opened a blank Rhino document, now I open a blank grasshopper definition. So I could start from scratch here. Um, Is a hard get off it for. And uh, but instead I'm gonna I'm gonna just open up the file that I have set up. So this is what a grasshopper file looks like in your file explorer. Um, and you know, grasshopper is like a whole pro, you know, a whole course in and of itself. We could really get into the weeds here. I'm I'm gonna try to skim through things pretty quickly and pretty efficiently because there's a lot that we could get through today. Um, if you feel like it's too fast or you don't really understand what's going on, please just like, uh, you know, unmute and say something or put something in the chat or, uh, you know, whatever. And we can, we can stop and kind of go through things a little more slowly. Um, so if you aren't familiar with Grasshopper, or if you aren't familiar with like um, scripting at all, right? What this does is it, it basically allows you to like um, automate and, and iterate through uh, geometric operations inside your modeling program, right? So, um, and what it does is, is rather than like work in code right in lines of code like in python or in c sharp or java or html right a programming language uh what grasshopper does is it uses these nodes right and so you you'll start to see like in a lot of different programs there you're starting to see like node editors right where you can string together these kinds of um, sequences of operations and so what those do is it, like like bundle um commands into these little visual uh, well, their nodes into these little visual nodes. Um, and it becomes Lucas. rather than having to like, uh, be fluent in a programming language, it's a little more intuitive, um, as a way to kind of iterate and, and try different, um, scripting combinations. Quick question. Yeah, Do you think course. that you could change the, dis the display to show like the, oh, the, the nodes uh, names? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, sorry, what is it? Uh, I actually haven't. Do you have the bifocals plugin? I don't have bifocals. I've never used it. Everybody always yells at me. <laughs> okay. Well, full names, full names is fine. Okay. Um, I'm so part of part of what I'm going to go do through actually right now is just showing you like where all these nodes are living like so I'll zoom out real quick on the right or on the left hand side of this is a kind of like. Um, catalog almost of a few of a bunch of different um, of the grasshopper nodes for uh, right inside so i'm going to go through and, and actually show you where a lot of those live. Um, so hopefully that will be um, an okay substitute in lieu of having bifocals turned on for you. Um, and again, so I'll also have this, uh, I'll make sure that Dan uploads this so that you guys can uh, poke around on your own time. Um, so real quickly, the other thing that you'll have to do uh, to get this work, well, you'll, you'll install Rhino inside. And that should also install um, the Grasshopper plugin. And so what you'll see then is, right, I have, a, I have a number of plugins here already installed, but you'll see one called Revit. And this is gonna have all these additional um, nodes that you can work through. They're you know, categorized pretty intuitively. The other thing that you'll see is that in the sort of most basic um, tool panel called params, right? There's also this bundle, they call it Revit primitives. And so you'll see um, in a minute how some of these are working. But basically to add um, 
a node to your grasshopper definition, you can either like click um, up in this in this toolbar, right? So if I want to add an addition node, right, a pretty simple math operation, I can click up here, just left click, and then left click again in the document, and now I've added this node. <clears throat> the other thing I can do is I can, if I know maybe what I'm looking for, I can double click here, right? So double left mouse click, and that's going to bring up this little prompt, and I can start to type in, I can say addition, and I can do the same thing and click here, and it'll have the same result. So you're going to basically be adding these things together, right? So like, let's say addition, and then uh, I'm going to add, so you'll see these all the time. Uh, I've learned, you know, basically everything I know from like YouTube tutorials. And so if this is something that interests you, I, I recommend just like diving into YouTube and you'll see these all the time, right? Everybody loves these things called number sliders. Um, and so if I make two of these, I'm going to say control C, control V, copy and paste. And so what Grasshopper does is then you start to wire these things together. So I'm just going to left click and drag from between these two little uh, plugs, left click and drag. And so now I have 0.25 plus 0.25. They're being added together in this node. And if I hover over the result, right, I see 0.5. That makes sense. The other thing I can do if I want to sort of see what's being output from here is I can double click and I can uh, either write the word panel and click here. And that's going to bring up just a sort of empty text box. There's a shortcut here for this too. If you do double slash, that also brings up a panel. It does the same thing. Um, and if I sort of click and drag between these, I get the same thing. So instead of having to hover over this to see my output, um, I can just get it displayed uh, where I can see it all the time, right? So this is like a really simple little example of uh, how Grasshopper is working. The other important thing is, right, of course, this is sort of doing a live update. So if I start to adjust these values, you can see that my, my output is changing um, at the same time, right? And so you can imagine that there are all kinds of things that you can start to accomplish with this. Um, it's like really way more than we could even begin to get into just in this little 50 minute lesson. But I really, if this is something that, you know, starts to spark an interest, I really recommend that you can, uh, you know, I'd be happy to talk more about it after, you know, after the lecture is over or at another time or, or whatever, you can get Dan to give you my email or, or whatever. Um, so, so with all that said, Grasshopper comes with a number of sort of native vanilla components, right? There's all kinds of like geometry handling stuff for um, creating geometry, for breaking down geometry, for uh, analyzing surfaces and curves and meshes, for intersecting geometry, different sort of display properties, right? These are all sort of built in. And then there are all these additional plugins that extend the functionality of Grasshopper, right? So like Radiance, uh, honeybee, ladybug, these are all for sort of energy and daylighting analysis. Um, anemone does sort of like, um, anemone is kind of complicated. We don't have to talk about that. Kangaroo does like physics simulations, right? You can model like things stretching and bouncing and bending and folding. And Revit, right, plugin extends the functionality is what's going to give us this bridge. Um, so starting from the sort of main parents panel, right? We have these things called Revit primitives. And so you can see here, if you expand this, right? I'm just gonna left click on this little arrow here. It's gonna bring down this menu and you can see that there are all kinds of what they're calling primitives and, you know, probably look a little familiar to you guys, right? Like grid, level, ceiling, curtain system, family type, work set, sheet, right? These are all some of the sort of fundamental building blocks um, of Revit geometry and of Revit uh, projects setup and kind of documentation elements, right? All these things are sort of building blocks. And um, what these are going to help you do 
is take information from Revit and bring it into your Rhino document. So like, for example, if I take type here, I click, I place it in. Right now, there's nothing going on. I have this little orange warning and it says, floating parameter type failed to collect data. This is a little bit of like a roundabout way of saying that basically nothing is coming in, right? I have no input, right? And we can see that and that's that makes sense and that's fine. But what the really awesome thing about this is, is that I don't really need any input just yet. I can right click on this and it's gonna bring me this little uh, expanded uh, context win window, <clears throat> excuse me. And what I can do then is start to um, enter, you know, add information to this node, right? So if you remember, this is our type node. So if you think about sort of the hierarchy of Revit elements, right, we're going from some of the model category, right? Model categories, annotation categories, analytical categories, these kinds of things. Within the model categories, right, there are all of these all these different sort of um, types of information and geometry that we can store. So some of it is pretty fundamental architectural stuff, right? Roofs, uh, floors, stairs. Some of it is kinds of system base, right? So like mechanical equipment sets, uh, plumbing, um, ducting. Some of it is structural, right? Columns, beams, beam systems. There are all these things. So let's let's keep this pretty straightforward. Let's say uh, floors, and then right. So now we start to see um, some of our floor families, right? And we can. There's only one type of uh, family within the floor category, and so now we can get all these types within the floor family, right? And so if we went into our Revit document, we would see this, right? This is a pretty boilerplate Lake Flato template. If we say uh, add floors, right? We only have one floor family and we have these floor types and these correspond to what we're seeing in our grasshopper window, right? We're reading from our Revit document into our grasshopper document. And this will be really useful down the line, right? So right now we're just getting information from Revit, but at some point we're gonna wanna um, send geometry back to Revit. Sorry, my, uh, my computer is not having fun right now. Sorry. Um, we're gonna to wanna to send geometry back into Revit and we're gonna to wanna to send it with information, right? We don't wanna just send like dumb geometry back in. We wanna be able to use it in the same way that we use sort of our information rich um, Revit geometry and Revit data, right? So these are, so these primitives then are ways that we can start to uh, like extract some of that and especially like category, family type uh, material, right? If we like click on the material, we get a list, a little index of all the different material types that live inside our Reddit document right now. If we say, uh, I don't know, um, let's see, level, right? We get a, a list of all the levels in the document. So some of these are, um, reading from Revit, and some of them are gonna send to Revit, right? So if we were to say uh, like wall, um, I think if I remember correctly, if we say set one wall, what we're gonna do is we're gonna have a chance to actually pick in our Revit document, right? So you can see Grasshopper has sort of disappeared. Revit has come to the front. <clears throat> And now I can only, whenever I, like if I hover over the roof, I can't select. But if I hover over a wall, now I can pick one of these. And if I left click on this wall, right, what you're gonna see all of a sudden is that I'm bringing, right, you can see that wall is highlighted. So I brought that wall from Revit and now it's living in my Grasshopper document. 
and then my Rhino space, right? So this is this is how we start to bring information from Revit into Rhino. Mm -hmm. um, does that kind of make sense to everyone? If you all have questions, please, again, just feel free to call them out. Um, so that's kind of like the primitives, right? These are these are ways to get get information from Revit, bring them into Rhino. If we go to the Revit tab, this is where there's a lot more flexibility. And what I've what I've set up is basically a, a kind of a catalog of these different um, you know subcategories of all these different components, right? So build is corresponding to build category corresponds to category direct shape, document, element. Uh, some of them I've skipped over, family, right? Filter, I'm not gonna get too far into right now. Material, model, site, right? These are all corresponding to these um, collections of, of nodes that live up in the, in the toolbar. And so we'll just kind of quickly try to go through some of these and cover some ground pretty quickly when we have 20 minutes left. Um, but all of the, you go, again, you can just come revisit this if you're, if you're interested at a later date. Um, so build, what build is going to do is uh, basically like, um, sorry, this is in the, the wrong thing to delete this. Um, build is going to add uh, geometry and it's going to add it in general based on um, families and types, right? So add beam, right? You can imagine that this is adding beam families that are in Revit. Add ceiling, right? This is adding ceiling families and types. Columns, right? Columns live as families in Revit, right? These are adding things um, that are already in your Revit document, right? Add root. So what I've done is I have a, this is called query categories. This is a component that's reading all the categories from the Revit document. I'm using some grasshopper components to filter through. Um, and then I'm using some sort of selector components in grasshopper to select categories more specifically, right? So I'm going from um, all the categories, I'm filtering through framing, right? I'm using a text search for framing. And now I have my two categories of framing. Then within the framing category, I'm filtering through the different families of framing, right? So these are my structural framing families. We have C channels, wide flange, dimension lumber, heavy timber, hollow tubing, round tubing, right? These are all living in Revit. And then from there, I'm filtering in the C channel type I have a, a couple of different dimensions of C channel already loaded in to Revit, right? So I'm picking from those. And so then what I'm doing, this component, right? This is our add beam, right? You can see that up here, it's coming in. And what it's asking for are curves, right? So what this does, this is a, a grasshopper component. It's called curve. Curve lives uh, here in geometry. Right, this is one of our sort of primitive types. And what it does is it's gonna add a, a beam to a curve uh, in from Rhino, right? So right now what I have are these, um, let me hide everything right now, right? Right now I just have these, these curves floating in space. I drew these out here. I can draw some more. Let me let me show you how this works, right? So I'm using the line command. I draw a line. I'm going to add double click right in Grasshopper. I'm going to say curve and add this component. And then I'm going to right click on curve. And I'm going to say set one curve, right? So now I'm in Grasshopper. I'm getting geometry from Rhino, right? So now when I click on curve, I just assigned it, right? I have that curve living there. If I say, um, if I connect this curve to this add beam component, right? I'm gonna replace it. And then I'm gonna right click and I'm gonna say preview on, right? All of a sudden what I did 
is I added um, a Revit family and I assigned it to this Rhino geometry. So that's one way that we can it's kind of work between these two things, right? I'm assigning kind of a line-based family, right? You know, beams are, are linear. We, we typically use them as kind of line-based components. I'm assigning it to a Rhino line and then it's coming back into Revit um, as, right, you can see it right here. This is our beam. And so right now uh, it's pinned in place. If I move, right, hang on, sorry, I have this tiny little screen that I'm working on. If I move this curve from here and I drag it up, right, so now it's updating in Revit. I have this live live link between the two. And if I were to like, right, scale this curve, make it really short, move it, rotate it, right? All of that is happening sort of live in Revit. So right, you know, this isn't sort of hosted to anything, right? Like a lot of times, Typically in Revit, right, you're going to be hosting your beams to levels or hosting them to reference planes. Right now, there's none of that going on. It all lives purely in this kind. It's all defined in this Rhino space. If I delete this curve, right, it deletes out of, out of Revit. So this is, this is where you start to get into some really interesting stuff, right? You can start to, like, imagine that you can, you know, pretty quickly generate geometry in Rhino. Um, maneuver it around really easily, right? Especially at a concept stage, um, you know, Revit can be a little bit cumbersome, right? It's great during documentation because of how precise everything is in its hosting, right? You want all your beams hosted to uh, levels and surfaces, right? You want everything kind of snapped in place, but at a concept stage as you're, you know, trying to work quickly, quickly and get a sense of, you know, structural feasibility or figure out sort of your depths of cavities, you want to be moving pretty fast. And so Rhino inside then allows you to have kind of that rapid pipeline. Um, so those are, and so I won't do all of them right now, but um, build is a build is kind of one of the ways that you're going to be adding geometry from a Revit family into the document. Where do you um, find the item selector? Um, all those blue things. So, <laughs> so that's actually, so in this, in this uh, little header, right, I have two plugins that are used here and I have a link for you to go download them. Um, the item selector is from human. This is an amazing plugin. If you guys are into them, I highly recommend downloading this one. Um, it lives right here. I use it all the time. I use it in almost every definition I write. <clears throat> um, super helpful when you're sharing out to other people it's just like a really intuitive little uh, graphic object that makes things um, pretty easy to like select through lists and, and pick items um so category right this is going to be reading from revit i already mentioned once right so in the privatives, we have this little category tab here. Um, we also have ways to read category information living here, right? So these are more in-depth, um, but we can query category, right? If we do this, we just get a text output. We get this long list of every single category in our Reddit document. Um, this is a little text search that I put together, right? So this is going to filter that list and it's going to select any um, category with the word ceilings in it, right? So we're just getting the one ceiling right now. And from there, I can learn more about the category ceilings, right? So if I add another little text panel to read out, right? Now I'm finding out all the different parameters that exist in the ceiling category, um, right? So these are all... Uh, Parameters, right, you can imagine that for a given type, you might have different values or for a given instance of the ceiling, right, you're going to have different um, values for all of these. And so as you start to get into 
more complex projects, you want to be able to extract that information from your Revit file. And, and this is one of the ways to do it. Um, another useful thing is, is subcategories, right? So within the category ceilings, this is a component that will then extract all the different subcategories that live um, within ceilings. Um, and then this is like an even more broad uh, sort of, you know, extracting component, right? This is reading from Revit and it's reading um, the different uh, types within the document. Um, you guys get the idea. So this is one, this, this little setup here, you know, if you're ever going to be using Rhino inside, feel free to copy this. This is one way to search through stuff is with this little text search that I, I rigged up another way to do it um, to sort of filter at an early stage is to use this category types picker. It lives right here. Um, and this way you can sort of at least specify between like the annotation categories, the internal categories, analytic categories, and so on. Um, this built-in categories, um, where is that lid? lids up here. I don't know if you guys know this. If you're ever looking, if you ever need to find out where something is, if you hold control alt and then click and hold with your left mouse button on a component, it'll do this little highlight thing. Um, so there's a built-in categories picker here. And so you can do the same thing. These are a little clunky. I don't really like using these. This list is so long that it's not um, super intuitive to get through. And then of course, this is our component from our Rhino or our Revit primitives. And this is kind of what I was showing you earlier, right? Where you can go through and select the categories um, by right clicking and bringing up this context menu. So if I were to say like uh, columns again, right? Now I have that, that category columns coming out and I could go back in and say, uh, if I were to come copy and paste, control C, control V, and bring this into categories, right click and say, disconnect. Uh, okay, not specific enough. Anyway, uh, moving quickly. Um, we have what, 15 minutes left? <laughs> um, so direct shapes, this is a way to bring um, geometry in to Revit, right? So a direct shape is, I have this little note here, right? This is kind of the dumbest sort of least information rich way that you can add uh, a piece of geometry back into your Revit document. Um, but what I've done here, what's going on here is um, we have our, our category picker, we're adding, right, we're searching for our ceiling categories, we're adding our basic ceiling family. Um, and then we are adding this as a direct shape, right? So if we preview on, Sorry, guys, it's been a minute since I set this up. Um, okay, actually, you know what? Let's just skip the direct shapes for now. This is the worst way to add geometry. In general, it can be quick. And if you just need to see something in Revit, it could be an okay way. But in general, I would recommend um, not doing it this way. And we're just going to skip down all this stuff. We're going to go straight to family. So what's really awesome about this is that rather than having to um, build a family from, you know, in like a family template using uh, Revit geometry and Revit constraints, you can build a kind of quick and dirty family in 
uh, Rhino through the Revit pipeline, bring it in, and you can then sort of have all this sort of, all the information, um, you, can, you can make it kind of information rich, right? So this is a really kind of simple, uh, dumb family, right? Right now, this is, um, we review, right? This is just a box, right? This is just a, a box uh, in Rhino, but it's creating a family in, and you can see, right, that that box is sort of visible here. It's not part of the Revit document, but we can see it. Um, and what that has done is it's added a family, right? If I say, if I go here, right, and I let's go down to our family browser, our project browser, and we just go to generic models, right? That family has been created, right? Family name test. It's under generic models, and uh, we can add it, right, to our Rhino document, right? I just add this stupid box. It has no information about it, right? There's nothing stored. It has no category, it has no real information, but it's at least there, right? So that that's possible. What I've done over here, sorry, I keep spazzing out. Uh, this is a little bit more complex in the family setup, right? There are kind of more things than we'll really get a chance to cover. I wish I had more time with you guys to go through this, but what this is doing is it's setting up um, some materials, right? Some custom materials in Grasshopper. It's feeding those uh, into um, our family creator. It's assigning um, those properties to the family. And then it's adding that into the Revit template. So really quickly, right? What we're doing, here's our little category selector. And what we're gonna do is we're just gonna add a really simple table to the document. So um, if we say, I'm gonna turn on here and here, let me quickly um, disable. So what you can see, right, is this really dumb little table that I made. It's four, it's like four rectangular, four, uh, you know, yeah, boxes. Um, and I have one of them is assigned to the tabletop, right? And one of them, one of these groups is assigned to table legs. So what I'm doing here, and this is all under, um, uh, family, right? So I'm going to do control alt left click, right? You can see where this is. This is living in uh, family. It's called component family form. And what this is going to do is it's going to allow you to define part of the geometry within a family, right? So rather than bring in the table legs and the table top as one object, I can actually sort of separate them um, bring them in, assign different materials, assign different subcategories, right? So I'm creating a subcategory called tabletop. I'm assigning it to this geometry right here. I'm giving it, my materials aren't set up right now. Um, <laughs> so forgive that, but I'm assigning a material right here. Um, and then we're bringing both the, uh, Right, we're bringing our tabletop and our table legs into this component here. And this is called new component family. This is what we saw before. And this is gonna add a family to your Revit file, but it's not actually going to load it into your Revit document, right? So right now you can see, right? Our table is kind of red, but I can't select it. I can't tab through, I can't get it. It doesn't actually exist as geometry in Revit. What it does exist as is if we go here and we go to furniture, what we're gonna do is, I have this disabled for now, I'm gonna say enable. And we're gonna have this long loading moment and what you should see in just a second, right? We just added new table, 
to our Revit file, right? So again, it doesn't yet exist as geometry, but it's loaded as a component in the file. Um, and so now what we can do, right? And so this has all our information, right? We have a category, it's in category furniture. We have um, our subcategories. There's not really gonna be a whole lot of information right there, but um, we have sort of materials assigned separately. And now if we say, uh, if we recalculate this, what we should get, here this is what it is we need this is all right so now if we recalculate this now we just added our table <clears throat> into run into revit and so, right, we can tab through, and it's in exactly the same location um, as we've specified. So this is, this is how I would really recommend you do everything, right? Because now, now that you have it as a, a kind of family component, right, now you can use it in scheduling. Um, you can use it in view filtering, right? If you don't want, if you want your Rhino inside components to be visible in some views but not in others right now you can be much more precise in how you're um, setting up your view templates how you're filtering those out um, and uh, it just adds a lot more of the sort of the really what revit is really good at it extends that functionality to your rhino geometry um, Right. Does that all, does that make sense to everybody? I'm sorry. This, I know that this was kind of like a crazy flurry of information. There's like so much stuff that we haven't even gotten a chance to cover. Um, if you take one thing away from this, I would say like, just try to look through what's listed here under family and then what's sort of, I'll clean this up and make it a little more coherent for you guys before I send it to Dan. But these are the two things that I would really pay attention to because this is what is sort of most powerful, right? We're reading some information from Revit, right? We're getting our categories. We could even, right? I was creating a material, which is a pretty cool thing that you can do, but you could also um, read materials from Revit and assign an existing material to these objects. And then we're taking geometry that lives in Rhino and we are sending it back to Revit with some of these, um, with this information then sort of embedded back into that geometry, which is what Revit is, you know, so good at and, you know, best used for. Um, and then if any of you have any questions, uh, we have like <laughs> three minutes left, um, but I'd be happy to explain anything. If any of you want to see more, you know, I'm happy to stay on a little longer and run you through some of the rest of this stuff. Um, but just let me know. And otherwise, um, you know, I feel like that's, that's pretty much what I came prepared with today. I hope that was at least enough to show you some of what's possible. There's some good, uh, every, you know, again, like I mentioned before, everything um, I know about Rhino Inside, I've basically learned uh, from YouTube, this guy, uh, Oliver Thomas. Um, has some uh, pretty good sort of introductory videos um he's a he's a little more <laughs> experienced at teaching this stuff than i am so it's a little more coherent and you can you know pause and rewind but there's a whole there's a whole um sort of ecosystem of uh forums right this is a great uh 
sort of resource. Um, these are videos by Scott Davidson, who is one of the lead uh, developers. Um, this is where a lot of the sort of documentation, oh, wait, oh yeah, uh, guides, guides and reference here, right? This will help you kind of understand a lot of the components, how that all works. Um, you know, it lays out pretty coherently the, the functions of the different nodes, the different context menus, um, all that kind of stuff. Their forums, you know, the forums are actually super helpful. They're pretty well supported. There are a lot of people that participate. Um, so if you need help getting started and getting a project off the ground, you know, people are usually pretty willing to help out and answer questions on here. Uh, so 